Okay, so let, so Steve uh, Azevedo is our keynote speaker. He is he graduated with a, a bachelor's of science in double E from UC Berkeley. Received a master's in double E in biomed engineering at Carnegie Mellon in 1978. After which he joined the laboratory and earned his PhD at UC Davis in 1991 for research in model-based tomographic reconstruction imaging. Interests have included the computational signal and image processing research, computer algorithms, numerical methods, uh, display techniques, inspection images. Uh, he has held a number of, of leadership positions, uh, project leader for the Livermore Explosive <coughs> Detection Pro Program, uh, project leader for the, for the NIF shot data and analysis, and for a project leader for the micro, impulse imp uh, micro power impulse radar, as well as being deputy division leader. And uh, for eight years, he was uh, he was a predecessor to me as director of the Center for Advanced Signal and Imaging Sciences, and has been on a num uh, the scientific advisory committee for the ICAL EPCS conference series. He retired in 2015 and is returning as a research uh, a consultant for the Non-Destructive Characterization Institute at LNL. He has over 50 uh, refereed publications and conference papers six patents and four R&D 100 awards for technical uh, excellence. So please let me, uh, uh, wel let's welcome uh, Steve Azevedo to talk about signal and image processing groups at LLNL. All right, so let me uh, start by, by thanking you, Dave, and, and the whole committee, uh, you know, Ryan, Judy, Randy Roberts, and Kyle Chanty, of course, uh, for this opportunity. I, it's a real, Honor actually to be a uh, to be the keynote speaker here at Cases because there've been so many really powerful uh, speakers at, that we've had over the years, over the 24 years, speaking at, at Cases as as keynote speakers. It's another reason I'm wearing a tie. Um, and uh, so I, I decided to do the, the talk from here and um, and you know go, really go through some historical events. That um, that happened around signal and image processing at the lab, uh, starting as I said, uh, from the transition from you know analog techniques that we had to to digital ones, and uh, the stories that I'm going to tell are from uh, my perspective, focusing on a few programs that I was involved with, and um, and uh, so I, I apologize if I if I miss a lot of it. And I, there's a lot to cover in in, uh, in these slides, and uh, so so we'll see what happens, and I'll tell you these. Five minutes at the end for, for um, questions. Dave, how long do I have now? What, what would you say? Right. So this talk will be recorded, sorry, but uh, it is. Go ahead with your regular talk. Don't worry about the time. Okay. All right. So let's let's just start off. Uh, signal process and image processing really are everywhere from the beginning of the lab in 1950. Um, every program at the lab collects, processes, analyzes, displays, and models data uh, in multiple dimensions. And um, this comes out a lot in, in Bruce Tarter's book. I just want to give a shout out to that. And GID has two copies if you don't want to take buy it. But um, it, it really goes through all the history of the lab, including the lower right there is a picture of an underground nuclear test, which it's hard to imagine since they, they haven't been doing them since 1996. Um, what what it was like down there. Uh, there's a you can see the devices in the in the center there, and then there's this miles of cable. The device goes down a mile or more down hole, uh, and all those cables aren't to to set the thing off. They're to measure what's going on down there and bring it up to the surface to a bank of trailers that are sitting on the side. Those uh, and and those trailers collect as much data as they can from whatever sensors are down there. Um, as quickly as they possibly can on analog methods um, and uh, and store it before everything below ground gets obliterated. And um, so th that was signal processing at, at that, those times. We were starting the first underground test was 1951, before the lab started. And uh, and then after the limited test ban treaty in 1963, all of them were underground. And that's how they did it under that. Tom Ramos gives a great set of talks on these two. If you have access to internal, this is only on the internal lab site. Um, and it, it, they're just excellent. And, and if you watch them, you see that, you know, how signal and image processing comes into all of it. And of course, the cases website has a bunch of stuff. 
the point is that, that the lab, uh, our lab, and for those who aren't lab people, uh, this has been true from the very beginning. We, we follow the scientific method just all the way from the beginning. And it's observe, question, make a hypothesis, predict what's going on, make a test, and that's where the data analysis comes in and analyze that data. And then the big thing is to iterate back and new hypothesis if they need to. Uh, so that, that was similar to some things that I learned back in um, in school. The adaptive filters were, were kind of new. Um, these are, uh, this was developed by mainly by Bernie, Bernard uh, Woodrow at Stanford. And it came up with a book in 1985 to describe these. And of course, they're used in every cell phone now to, to get rid of the extraneous noise and various other measurements, including, I think, the adaptive optics of the glass for you. But you guys can correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, uh, anyway, Bernard Woodrow was one of, our, one of our keynote speakers. So that's why I bring that one up. Another one that we tried to get was, was uh, Rudolf uh, Coleman. And he, uh, but, uh, he was sick at the time when we tried to get him to come, but we were talking about the Coleman filters. There's another uh, kind of thing that follows this, that, that very nicely follows this um, scientific method where you predict what, you, you take a measurement, you predict what's going to come up next, you compare that measurement to a model. And that's, in this case, a state space model. Uh, and you come up with a gain, you come up with the errors, and if they very nicely didn't call them errors, which sounds kind of negative, it's called innovations. But how do we change the model to, to take uh, into account the, the new data that we have coming up, update the error covariance, and then start the process over again. Um, anyway, that was very, very interesting work. And then, of course, digital signal processing in the, in the 70s was big. Uh, Alan Oppenheim and Ron Schaefer, classic text that everybody uses. Uh, or used at the time, uh, Alan Oppenheim was one of our, our keynote speakers also, which was, uh, which was great fun. Uh, even more fun was the dinner the night before with all the MIT graduates we had here. It was very nerdy, uh, but, uh, but it, was, it was very fun. Um, okay, what I'm going to do is I'll turn off my, my video here so you don't have to look at me, and we'll, we'll continue on with, with some of the other things that happened. Oh, but first of all, we have to thank Jim Candy. I hope he's online. I, I, I didn't check to see who's there, but uh, uh, Jim Candy taught me a lot of this stuff, and uh, he was the first center director for, for cases. Um, chief scientist in engineering now and, and adjunct professor. A uh, lot of kudos. He's a, he's a mentor to many of us at the lab, the giant in single language processing, author of six books. Those are four of them you see up there. And he's still working at the lab. But the biggest thing, of course, is he hired me in 1979. Uh, well, yeah, any others into what was called the Signal and Image Processing Research Group under Rick Tugood. And uh, in the Engineering Research Division, which doesn't exist any longer, Ed Miller. Some of those names will come up later on, too. Anyway, thanks, Jim, for everything. Um, and uh, oh, that's right. Jim was a, a featured speaker also at CASIS after he uh, at, at um, it, This is a slide that, that Jim showed in 2011 when we had him as the uh, keynote speaker. Uh, I don't want to go through all the details on here, it's a lot, uh, but it goes back through there. But the real key is that he was, was pointing out that there's a lot of methods, uh, methods up on the top here that, that we use in signal processing and image processing all the time. Those methods then actually led to new projects. It wasn't as though those were only used to support the, the main lab mission, but in fact, generated our own projects like the laser guide, guide store, like breast cancer detection, many other things that, that came in to play all throughout that time, and also led to computer codes, uh, because we didn't have access to a lot of computer codes at the time. And um, so, you know, we, we, uh, we had to make our own, and, uh, and I'll show some of these, but here's, here's an early video, it's just to start things off here, that shows how digitizing of data was done. This is, was made in 1983, so listen to this. Data acquisition currently involves several time-consuming steps. Signals from an experiment are originally stored on analog tape as voltages from up to 30 simultaneous channels. This tape is then shipped to a central facility where the data is converted to binary form and recorded onto seven-track digital tape. Backlogs or hardware failures at this facility can cause delays of up to a month. 
Finally, the data gets read into the main computer center, where a variety of programs are employed for the analysis phase. If errors are detected at this point, some or all of these steps may have to be rerun. Sitting there, you know, you like that uh, that uh, voice there? That was me. <laughs> uh, I, I don't know why they chose me to give that talk. I'll show a little bit of that of, of the rest of that video uh, a little later, but um, just to give you an idea of, of what was what we had, uh, this is the early the early systems that we had. The Octopus system was the main computer systems in building 113 now, and, and um, yeah, you probably saw the Cray at the end, I think was a, the first one. Um, and then they had scattered around the lab um, at different places, these remote job entry terms, RJECs we call them. And you could go there and enter, used to, when I first started, card decks, but uh, then they ended up having little terminals that you could type things into and get printouts of, of what was going on. And of course you had to have the right hairdos at the time. Uh, shortly after that, we had uh, uh, what we'll call mini computers, VAXs, um, and uh, and microcomputers, uh, which were not not all that small. Um, and uh, and so we'll, we'll show some of those things too. So he, here is the the uh, how we did at signal acquisition. After that, we did a little video about what we call the signal and act, signal acquisition and processing station. I'll blame Jim for that title and the unfortunate. Uh, here's a different Physically, all of these components are mounted on this roll around cart. On this side are the signal conditioning units. And here are the computers and A to D converters. Over here is the disk storage. And this is the graphics terminal. All of this functionality is extremely accessible to the experimenter. In addition, SAPS is portable, inexpensive, and very easy to use. Let's say we have an experiment in this room from which we want to collect data. We simply move SAPS into position. Two people can do this easily. Attach the stabilizer feet. Unlock the disk drives. And plug it in. All that stuff you can do uh, with an Arduino now, I think. But uh, anyway, it's just kind of interesting <laughs> to, to see. You saw how, how big the thing was and how portable it was. Um, uh, Jim always laughed because it was actually designed and built by a fellow named Bob Guerin, who was probably six foot six. And that's why it's so tall. And as we all know, Jim is a little height challenge, so he, he complained a little bit. <laughs> we had a tall stool for him. Um, we also came up with some single. Uh, processing codes, and this one describes the SIG signal processing code, which was on Jim Q graph uh, in 1983, and, and uh, this, is, this is Daryl Lager speaking here on this one. Before we had the Interactive Computer Development Center, being a signal processing engineer was sometimes a frustrating experience. Oftentimes, each engineer had to develop his own special purpose codes for each problem. As a result, there was a poorly documented collection of codes running on different machines, each with a different user interface. On some system, there was only one way to get quick graphics hard copy. The engineer spent too much time programming things like graphics display and data input output, rather than researching and designing signal processing algorithms. So we in the engineering research division designed SIG, a general purpose signal processing code for lab-wide use. SIG was developed to provide the user with a set of tools for performing signal processing tasks. In addition, SIG was designed to easily incorporate new algorithms developed by the engineer. Yeah, so that's uh, that's describing the SIG signal processing. I see Roger's written some stuff. Are you recording now? Uh, y yes, I am. That's all right. Um, and uh, is the sound any better, Dave? Uh, no, I, are you, you optimized it for, for audio and visual? I tried, but I, it seems to me that, that that didn't seem to work. So I, I don't know what's going on. Maybe if I, I'm going to stop sharing for a moment. Let's see if I can get that back uh, and try it one more time. Uh, it actually doesn't give me the, the choice of doing that. 
If you don't mind, I'll, I'm just going to continue on. There's, not, there's a few more videos that are coming up, but there, there's no sound. I wanted to point out another thing, another thing that uh, was kind of difficult to do at the time was how to show images. Um, this is uh, this is showing how people got creative with with coming up with grayscale. There was a, um, a set of codes from Berkeley called Rec LBL, which did computer tomography reconstructions back in 1977. This thing, and, and I happened to take a class from Tom Budinger, who was leading that group, uh, who, by the way, was a keynote speaker for one of our cases also. Uh, and some of these people of mine, Houston, Grant Goldberg, they're sort of major people in, in computer tomography early on. Anyway, they came up with a, with a set of Fortran codes, and along with those Fortran codes was uh, that, that did, you know, all kinds of um, computer tomography reconstruction, including filter back projection and uh, uh, algebraic reconstruction techniques and, and direct Fourier transforms. Anyway, a lot of different methods. It's a pretty amazing set of codes, which we got a copy of and used as well. But it's just kind of interesting to see how they came up with how to do grayscale on printed sheet of paper. That's that's a picture from a big printout on, on paper. And somebody figured out how to, you know, overprint a bunch of characters to make different shades of gray, if you can imagine that. And uh, so that's still in the code, not too useful these days, but it just sort of points out the difficulties that we had at the time until things like workstations with grayscale were available. And uh, we uh, were lucky to get a couple of early things. So the first one is up here on the uh, uh, upper center is a Sun Microsystem computer. This is, we got serial number 256. This is before a mouse. And uh, I bet it was a very nice Unix-based workstation that could do uh, a lot of good, of good stuff. And coupled with that, shortly afterwards, was a Pixar image computer. Uh, how many of you, raise your hand, know about Pixar imaging computers? Probably very few. Only 300 of these, less than 300 of these were made at all. Uh, Lucasfilm in 90, 1979 came up with this idea of making their own render, graphics, graphics rendering computer so they could do better movies. Yeah, SIGGRAPH was a big time, big thing at the time and still is. Uh, anyway, it was acquired by Steve Jobs in 1986, but they stopped making hardware in 1990 and, and only a few of them were made. Still, we got one and uh, I'll show you a few movies from that. Uh, we also had this view imaging code, which I think was uh, a number of people, Jim Brazi, Mel Weeding, Ricky Miller, and others that, uh, that worked on that code and was used by a lot at the lab. And then and in the, uh, what was called the Image Processing Lab uh, with uh, Rick Tugut there on the right in his fancy pants. Uh, you can see what, what things looked like at that time. That's in Building 131 also. So here's an example of something we did in 1986. Using a Pixar computer, we, we had some x-ray data that we we had reconstructed that was unclassified. You'll see what this part is in a moment. We tried different different things like interactively slicing. So this is we had a mouse at this point, and we were able to you know move up and down and and see the inside of this part uh, from from different angles. Uh, then there's a simple three dimensional uh, visualization. I kind of see that. Then we went to something called chap volumes, which is trans transparent. Now you see it's a, it's a, uh, we scan that and, and reconstruct it, and all this data is coming from that. Uh, it's transparent, so you can see the handle on the other side of it as well. Then we did things like opaque surface sh shading, where you know, you're giving it a lighting source, for example, and you can see where, where the object is uh, there and see it more clearly. And then we did it with a cutaway view. Probably didn't tell that inside there, but there was actually a plastic spoon on the inside of that, um, uh, of that thing. And, and so you just, it's, it's kind of interesting to see that, that even there's a little plastic uh, structural element in there that's visible from the CT reconstruction. And so just treating those as different uh, uh, different parts of the, of the object and making it opaque, that was kind of all new at the time. Uh, Chuck Grant was the main guy who put, this, put that one together and uh, was impressed with that. But of course, we did a lot of things with computer tomography. Um, this shows some other parts that were that we're looking at here, we're trying to look for uniform density in a particular object. I actually don't know what this is. Maybe Harry remembers if you're on line there, Harry, you can see uh, um, what it is. 
and, and tell us what it is. And we, you pick different thresholds and you can see it was supposed to be uniform. It's basically white gloves inside there, but it wasn't. That was useful for the people who manufacture these to know. Um, so th this was the kind of things that we used the CT and then Pixar computer and the graphics display element in the image processing lab to do back in the 80s. Uh, here's another object here. You can see it had metal artifacts. We're going through the different slices of CT and right uh, coming up here, right there, there's a lot of metal artifacts on the edges. Those are the bright spots that's commonly known in CT and, um, and you know, difficult for, for looking at it and seeing what's, what's going on. But then of course you can take it and render that and get a picture of it and spin it around. Uh, and this was useful again for the people who were making these objects to kind of get, a, get an idea of what's going on. Then we did other things in the early 90s when, when uh, Soviet Union fell, when we were starting to get away from weapons. We had non-weapons applications. This is some data that uh, Harry's team took also on, on CT reconstruction of uh, a dinosaur egg. Came from China, went to uh, University of Notre Dame, a colleague of ours there. And we took images of it and kind of took it apart. You couldn't see much in the way of an embryo. We were hoping it could. We couldn't in that particular one. Um, Here's one of a reactor fuel tube in, from the Savannah River site. Um, and, and here, you know, the, the red part is the fuel is supposed to have been uh, uniformly uh, you know, inside of this, this uh, double shelled tube. And uh, so this was a way to see them through the CT. And of course, you can turn it sideways here and rotate it in a different direction and get an idea a little bit more. Some other examples of what, of what happened there. Now that whole dinosaur egg thing led to uh, a lot of stuff in 1994. It didn't hurt that the Jurassic Park was had come out about then, and so dinosaurs were really hot at the time. And we made an entente close up tonight. America close up tonight. What happens now to America's defense industry, especially this country's nuclear weapons facilities? The world's premier atomic research lab in California has found a solution, finding new missions for its elite scientists. NBC's Mike Jensen. Dick Landingham used to work on nuclear bombs. Now he's making lighter, tougher steel for tractors. Clint Logan was a Star Wars scientist. Now he's developing a better mammogram. Harry Martz worked on atomic weapons. Now he's studying the insides of dinosaur eggs. It's part of the big switch at the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, where they're turning swords into plowshares. Five years ago, half of Livermore's work was on nuclear weapons. Now it's less than a third. The laboratory that made its reputation on weapons of war has signed contracts for civilian projects with 76 companies in the last year and a half. 26 years ago, I just seen an idea about it. Um, Again, I apologize if, you, if you're not seeing these very well or hearing it very well. I have videos of all of these, in fact, that I and can share them, and they're, they're much longer. But I, I just wanted to give you some snippets of, of what we were looking at. Now, non-destructive characterization was uh, something that, that interested me, and so I did a lot of work with in, that, uh, in that area. And, and this is kind of a general um, image of, of, or a slide of, about what it is up on the upper left. We were able to do a lot of measurement systems. Uh, you saw their X-ray CT, so the sources are typically X-ray, but we used protons and neutrons, various particles, as well as electromagnetic waves and acoustic, and I'll show you some more of those. You, you have an object there that's, that, uh, that we're looking at and detectors, but coupled with that and was really important at our laboratory was being able to handle all the data, be able to model and simulate it with these high-performance computers and then do the interpretation and display and analysis. Um, so this is all part of that. You can, you can go to the NCI website there at the bottom to see a lot of the stuff that's happened over the years with that. But also, let me show you just one in X-ray computer tomography, which is um, really interesting to me. Uh, this, this plot shows across the bottom what size specimens we have. From way down to less than a micron bacterium, all the way up to cargo container size, 10 meters. 
Uh, and then on the vertical axis is x-ray energies in order to image these kinds of things. So the common x-ray imaging um, types of, object, uh, of uh, scanners are medical, and those are in that box in the middle, and security for baggage scanners in airports, uh, so sit in the middle. Of Cargo, there's a number of, the, of scanners that are being done now that, that uh, NCI and, uh, has been has been consulted on and talking about. What the lab has done here over the years is pretty remarkable in, in coming up with all of these other scanners and therefore all kinds of different applications from looking at very large objects way up on the top to very small ones. And I'll show a few of these on at the very low left, left side. Um, the point on this thing is that x-rays uh, at the lower right, they don't penetrate anything because uh, they're too low of energy to go through something like a cargo. At the upper left, it's the opposite. They are so highly um, um, energetic that they go through everything that's small and are only uh, useful for looking at things like steel and aluminum. Anyway, I just wanted to show the options that we have that are, that are all over the place. And here's a few of them. PCAT was one of them that's in, built, in building 227 um, that looked at a lot of different things, including explosives, which is shown up here. I, I really want to show this because Earl Updike is our the geography was pictured there, and, and he unfortunately had um, We built, Livermore built us this special system on the bottom for looking at nuclear weapons components. And it's used routinely all the time now in classified settings in the Pantex plant in Amarillo, Texas, which is where I started. Um, and uh, you can see it's a big six, six to nine MeV. Linac that starts that starts it and has a huge um, it's called has a huge detector on it. It's, I think 4K now, and uh, they, they do some amazing imaging with that one. And they stitch they, together multiple images to get to get the reconstruction. They didn't have any unclassified pictures except for this one. They, they just went out and, and being in Amarillo, they went downtown and, and picked up a. Uh, uh, armadillo with a with a Mexican hat on and they scan that. So that's what you see on the right. Um, I thought that was pretty funny. Uh, there's also this, these are the high really high end, very small objects that we're looking at. The little movie you see moving down there are are submicron beads that are being imaged. This is uh, uh, Chuck Given. And uh, and so you can see we're seeing very, very tiny objects. Um, field of view up to you know 65 microns, very very small, and and the lab has this capability and uses it routinely. Uh, we've also done in the past ultrasound breast tomography. This was in uh, collaboration with Carmona's Cancer Institute, and a number of us uh, on this call probably were involved with this project uh, in using ultra in actually developed an ultrasound scanner in again in building 327 for looking at. at I also wanted to give a shout out to the Livermore Tomography Tools team led by Kyle Champley and uh, there's, there's uh, Karina Bond pictured in there, but uh, this is a really remarkable code that the direct LBL code that I showed you earlier for, for CT uh, is, is really <laughs> very nothing, nothing compared to this one. It's, it's used, um, it's being abused uh, all over the place. It has not only reconstruction tools, but the pre-processing and post-processing that are needed and of course makes use of all the most recent hardware architectures and GPUs and so forth. So uh, great work being done there by this laboratory. And so you should take pride in it. <clears throat> One of the things we try to do at the lab again is really understand the physics. We want to characterize the object, not just get pretty pictures like you see on some of the things in the picture things showed us, but we want to get quantitative pixels that mean something. So for example, how does a TSA um, agent tell homemade explosives from peanut butter. You'll see something in there that maybe looks the same color, but how do you know one from the other? Same with a doctor being able to tell a tumor from a healthy tissue. You know. And so uh, our team, uh, really under the leadership of Harry and, and uh, you know, it was to be part of this, we came up with a new algorithm for dual energy CT to find us. This is a very detailed chart uh, that shows some of the the codes that we have in the bottom of the patents that this came out of this for CERS, system independent, row EZE, um, and uh, which is kind of detailed. But basically, 
we we took pictures of um, uh, or it took CT scans of many different parts. You can uh, you can see them on the left, and they all kind of bond together. It's difficult to tell one object from the other. But with SIRS, we were able to separate the water from delrin from ethylene, all these different things. They show up in different parts of it with 2% error. And this is a game changer, a changer for uh, TSA and for others. Uh, we, we hope in the medical community as well to actually find what the obvious. Um, other things that we've done, of course, is microwave tomography, and, and now I'll kind of switch into some of the work that we did on uh, in this area. This was done back in 98, I think, um, where we took images using a radar array that's in the lower left, pictured up from underneath that trailer, uh, and got images of the rebar mesh, that's all the rebar mesh in, in the concrete, you could tell if there was areas of damage. Um, it is surprising to me and to many of us that this technology is not used yet at this time, but we'll talk about some some uh, advances, and, and you saw one from Brian Worthman yesterday, if you were uh, if you were in that one, about how to make this even better. Um, but, uh, but it was pretty remarkable at the time, and it all came out of this micropower impulse radar invention in 1994. Uh, Edward Teller even commented on it, saying it was very simple uh, for doing near field motion sensing, and, but it ended up being a whole lot more. It was successfully commercialized, the second most commercialized, and led to many LLIO programs. Now, I, a year ago in 2019, I gave a talk on this, and there was a YouTube on it. You can, you can Google uh, YouTube as a Vito MIR and you can see it as well. But uh, it won a lot of kudos. Those are some of the things on the, on the bottom of the screen there. Uh, and let me just say a few, uh, show a few more of the things that we did with this micropower impulse radar, including, including that Hermes project I showed in the last slide. So here's Tom McEwen, the guy who invented it. Uh, he initially uh, was working in the laser program and uh, worked with Joe Kilkenny on coming up with a transient digitizer for NOVA. 23 giga samples a second. That required uh, quite some technology back then, although he did it in a very simple way. Um, and out of that, he thought that's pretty cool and went to his garage and came up with this idea uh, to, um, to turn that into a, a radar receiver and came up with that in 94. It's the basis of the motion sensors. At the time, radars were huge, enormous things, and to have it on a single board kind of raised the imagination. And then it came up with all kinds of other things like dipstick, uh, electronic dipsticks, to measure, which is probably the biggest uh, part of the, of the licensing revenue it came from fluid levels, so it seemed to leave it out in big tanks and other things. Uh, so you didn't have to have a dipstick. And then range finding in 98. Range finders um, is what we single processors wanted. Right? We now have a time series based on this signal instead of just a motion sensor. So the product ideas were in many different areas. I'm not going to describe these, but there are a lot of different areas commercially. And since 94, there were 197 patents on this. Uh, McEwen was amazing, a really interesting guy. And as part of making this talk, I I was, had the privilege of talking with him. He's now living in New Mexico and, and happy and still inventing, believe it or not. He left, he only stayed, he's not in 89, but he only stayed until 96, received more patents. Uh, anyway, for the lab, as far as the lab is concerned, we had 30 licensees and uh, a lot of royalties. Half of that went to the lab, half went to Tom, and he's a wealthy man, and uh, more power to him. He, the estimated sales was over 500 million. A lot of interest, a lot of press. It was very strange. Um, and I was asked to help put together some of the government applications of this rather than all commercial applications. But anyway, the, the commercial applications captured the imagination. These motion sensors, uh, these are some of the electronic dipsticks, down uh, fluid sensors, a sleep minder to you know make sure that you're sleeping OK. This is a, a soap dispensers. Uh, for, these all the time now. It's it's surprising that now you know our, we are expect the toilets to flush and the soap to come out and the, and uh, doors to open and lights to turn on with the, with us move, moving around. But that wasn't the case back then. And MAR had a big part of that. There's a stud finder that was part of our licensing, big big part of it as well. 
Uh, another stud finder, you can see that's ultra wide band radar technology. Oh yeah, we had some for toys. You'll we'll have to see my talk on that to hear the stories about that and golf. And uh, first radar guitar was Mike Campbell with uh, Scott Baxter, who was the, the guitarist for the Shaquille Dan and and um, and the Doobie Brothers, and and uh, playing the first, the very first, and only actually radar guitar. It didn't work, oh, but it did work. Uh, and, uh, so uh, ultra wide band. Let me just say what uh, we call it: imp, uh, impulse radar. Um, which most people think of, you have narrow band, we all know about that, it's very narrow in the frequency domain. Broadband and broad spectrum, we, and we encode information in, in, the, in the coding that we have in, in the different pulses that come out of that. But ultra wide band, what we did was go to impulse. And um, that's what McEwen had, had a very quick, quick and easy way and cheap way to come up with an impulse that's very, very wide band and way below that noise, noise floor on the right. Um, this was before it was okay by FCC. We had to deal with that, and, and there were a lot of other issues commercially we had to deal with. But uh, the whole point was we had uh, uh, microwatts of power drain, very low power, impulse like shape to it, and uh, it looks like random noise. Some of the things, but, but we had always done things with the lab and always done things with EMPs. Uh, I won't go through this whole thing either, but um, in 1962, there was a there was a, a bug contest that caused power failures 900 miles away in Hawaii from the EMP that happened. So the National Labs went and looked at that a lot. Uh, there was early impulse radar stuff done in, in the 1970s by Ross and Maury. And then Ed Miller, who you may recall was our division leader at the time, he came up with the first book on time domain measurements of electron magnetic. Um, and that was very important. And we continue to look at impulse electromagnetics for lots of different things. Uh, the lab looked at lots of things for, for MIRs, and I, I won't go through all these either, but basically it won a lot of R&D 100 awards, a lot of um, articles in, in Science and Technology Review, the laboratory uh, magazine. And um, we had funding up to like 20 million a year at its height. Uh, so a lot of things are still are doing. I'll just show a few of these here, like um, true protection, have little motion sensors, this was an electronic fence. You drop these items out of an airplane and uh, have them talk to one another and set up a little fence to determine to determine if somebody's moving through. It never really went off the ground. <laughs> Proximity fuses, which the Army was interested in. They would uh, detonate a few feet above the ground and cause uh, more damage than if they hit on, uh, detonated on impact. And so these work very well, as it turned out. Uh, we continue to use these uh, for measuring explosives in the high explosive facility here at the lab. Uh, they can measure the track of the explosions, and that's a very useful thing. We also looked at for uh, vital signs. This is a difficult thing to do, but uh, looking at uh, through rubbles and it was called disaster city. Uh, this was once the Oklahoma City bomber bombing in '95, and uh, so we set up a project that did some of that kind of work. And then, of course, after 9/11, we had a number of these sensors and. Uh, Within, believe it or not, within three days, the Department of Energy got us a flight, got the, these guys a flight. I was out of the country at the time and didn't have anything to do with it. A number of these guys bravely went back there and, and used the MIR to try to find things, but after three days, uh, they didn't find it. may see John Chang there, still at the lab, Doug Poland, uh, Tom Rosenberry, anyway, uh, Mark Riders in the background. And uh, that was pretty amazing. Uh, that, that we had that deployment and were able to get or learn a lot from it. What was really cool to those of us who do imaging is that uh, with narrow band, you get this very wide spot. The focal spot is, is not very good. When you do beam forming, it's, it doesn't get real narrow, but ultra wide band, you get narrow. So therefore, you can do some interesting imaging. This is because you're using many different frequencies and you can actually identify things much closer. So we looked at things like finding um, people behind behind barriers. You can't. You don't get very good resolution compared to like cameras and things. But it, it's not bad, right? Uh, we also look for mine detection. That was a, a very important part of it. Uh, the difficulty there is you can you're also finding you can find plastic mines, but you also find uh, other things, and it's difficult to tell the difference between a hole in the ground versus or a root uh, of a tree or a big rock versus other things. So clutter was a diff, difficult problem in that. Biometric devices, this is still being done by John Chang. There's still some work on, on hematoma detectors, pneumothorax, finding the vital signs. 
um, that won a tech transfer award in 2011. Very nice. And some uh, communications work that's really being led here at the lab by Fareed Dawa and doing, done with um, Direct Solutions, which is Rick Two Goods company now. And so they come up with RFID tags that don't require batteries that, and that use this technology or spin-offs of this technology and um, are, are very jam resistant. It's so difficult. They, they can't even detect that these things are in existence and unless you're looking for them. And it works in tunnels and all kinds of things. It, it's pretty nice work. And then the biggest project that's been, that's been going on continues to go on, and, and these guys are actually on deployment right now, is uh, looking for buried threats. My radar is the, is the project name. Uh, Stephen Bond and um, Reg Beer and Brian Weil are all kind of the main parts of it. They're, they're down at, the, at the, one of the Air Force bases in Southern California doing some, some tests now, and they continue to work. But in particular, looking at putting them on that drone, if you see in the very center, that is a drone that carries multiple radar antennas and uh, is used for imaging beneath ground. Very interesting stuff. So that's uh, the most of it. I'm, I'm sorry if I went over a little bit of time, but basically I wanted to say that the lab has nurtured signal processing in a big way, including these cases workshops that have been useful from the beginning uh, for hiring, for funding, for all kinds of support. Uh, I was pleased to see that, that IEEE joined cases in 2011, and uh, welcome to all people who heard about it from, from that, and it showed many other areas of progress besides just signal and image processing, just <laughs> uh, in computing, computations, uh, quantum computing, and deep learning. I didn't say anything about NIST diagnostics and optics, and optics inspection, but worked in there as well. And if you look on their website, their, their goal is to uh, encourage young engineers and scientists to explore the resources, people experience, and software available at the lab. Um, I, I also like what Jim Candy said on his, the signal processing is better than all deliver more applications, providing a foundation for a company. So it's been a, a great career, and, and uh, I was also pleased to see that Glassdoor found that the lab here was um, very high on their list. And uh, you know, six out of the top 100 for, uh, uh, for looking at, at um, for places to work in 2020, and, and that's great. I, uh, Wanted to just a simple story on that. I, I sent that ranking to my children who uh, all took jobs other places and didn't come back to Livermore, didn't follow their father into this great career. And uh, so they, of course, wrote back very nicely. They said, uh, well, you know, you're number six on you, but maybe you want to go and, and move up farther and get up to to, uh, to number four. Because you see on there, it's number, it's uh, in and out burger, and of course they, they sent me that app application. They also sent me this nice hat, so I can, you know, try it out. And how's that look? You know, you know, I don't know. I, I don't think so. I think I'll stay at the lab. Thank you very much, everybody, and uh, and I'll look forward to answering any questions. Thank you, Steve, for a very interesting talk. All the way, it covers a lot of many years. So. <laughs> And some of the people in there I remember seeing long, you know, quite a while back, so, and also with hair. Uh, yes. so. <laughs> so, and so we have time for some questions. I have one question in the Q of it, Q and A. Uh, did we ever cut out the area under the curve so that we could and uh, and weigh the paper for the interval? Yeah, we saw we saw a great. Uh, tracing the curve on the screen. So, <laughs> yeah. Uh, did we ever do that? I think uh, that's something we did a while, you know, before. Well, the before the, yeah, before digital techniques. I mean, a, a lot of a lot of people did do that. Um, and uh, I, I think I mentioned before we started that um, my friend uh, Jim Murray is his name, who's a laser physicist here at the lab for many years. Um, and he was the one who reminded me, I think he was, he was talking about earlier in the 70s, maybe late 60s, where he would, uh, they would, you know, print out, print out or get a, an oscilloscope trace, or they actually had a way of, of projecting, I forgot how, uh, up onto the wall, a picture of a, of a waveform, and then they would go up with, at, like, like uh, Greg, at the time, Greg Clark, I'm sorry, I didn't mention that was Greg Clark in that video, uh, who uh, then transitioned to Grace, and, um, and like like we showed in that one, 
um, you know, drawing on it and then trying to measure it. Uh, that was really before my time, um, but it, it just kind of highlights how difficult things were early on. So, yeah. <laughs> where, where'd you get the questions? Are they somewhere? Uh, the Q and A. Oh, okay. There we go. Yeah. Did I don't? Does anyone else have a quick question? So, oh, actually, we are privileged to have our associate director of engineering that is joined us, and I think he would like to give us a few remarks. And so, I'm going to hand that uh, and the presentation ball over to him if he wants to. Uh, show us anything or just want to uh, uh, talk to us. So uh, Anantha, I think you have the, you should have the floor. Uh, thank you, Dave. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I just want to say, Steve, uh, you know, as passionate as I am about science and technology, it is really hard uh, to beat in and out burger. I mean, um, I, 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 unfortunately, I don't think you're going to ever come on on top of uh, In-N-Out Burger. So I, I, well, I'm glad you saw that in that. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I think that is a lost cause. So let's focus on um, making other accomplishments happen. Um, so I, again, uh, good afternoon, folks. Uh, thank you for uh, giving me an opportunity to say a few words. Uh, as you heard from Steve, uh, signal and image processing pretty much cuts across all of the lab's missions, whether it is the basic science of interpreting um, astronomical images from telescopes or whether it is looking inside parts that we have produced here at the lab in our manufacturing shop or whether it is looking at the kinds of radar images that um, that Steve showed. Signal and image processing is really at the front lines of, uh, of uh, what we do. And uh, really with, with all of the developments and emerging technologies, emerging algorithms, emerging capabilities that's happening in the community, it's very important that we stay engaged with, uh, with the community that is external to the lab to make sure that we are able to bring in the state of the art um, uh, into the lab. So I value the collaborations that we are able to establish through cases. I value this uh, workshop that we have every year that brings together uh, people from all around, all around the country to talk about new and emerging capabilities in these areas. And I also value the research collaborations that happen that not only offers us um, the ability to uh, tap into some of these emerging capabilities, but also helps establish a pipeline to universities in ways that uh, we can bring in the future talent into the lab. So uh, having, a, uh, having the cases workshop and the cases engagements has been invaluable to the lab, both the scientific mission as well as our national security mission. So I want to thank you uh, for being a part of uh, this community and this group. Um, so uh, Steve, Dave, and many other leaders uh, who um, who have kept this going in a very successful way, thank you for, for doing this. Uh, and again, I want to welcome you. Uh, I know it is the second afternoon that you are out here, uh, but I still want to uh, take the chance that I have now to welcome all of you to this to this meeting. Well, thank you, Ananta. Uh, of course, you're always welcome to join us, no matter uh, you know where you are. So please, uh, yes. please do so. And you're, I think you're now on the mail on our mailing list, so you're going <laughs> to be receiving these. Uh, these, uh, you know, for quite a long time here. So, <laughs> yes, thank you. Yes, I would appreciate receiving that information. Okay, well, that's uh, you're you're very welcome. So, thank. You.